Hello everyone, I am Rahul Gosain. And I'm Rohit Gosain. And we are Oncology Brothers. In 2023, we saw more than 40 new FDA drug approvals and indications for different diseases in oncology. As a general community medical oncologist, we need to be aware of all this data and how this fits in in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. To make sense of all this, that is available and to focus on current standard of care in triple negative breast cancer. We're joined by Dr. Ruth O'Regan, a breast medical oncologist, and Dr. Anna Weiss, a breast surgical oncologist from my home institution here at University of Rochester, Wilmot Cancer Center. Ruth and Anna, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Anna, Ruth, welcome. I feel uh, outnumbered, as I was saying before, part of Wilmot Cancer family for now. Um, all right. For today, Rahul, as Rahul stated, our focus is talking about triple negative breast cancer, mainly focusing on standard of care from medical and surgical oncology standpoint. To get us started, Ruth, can you please walk us through your approach when it comes to early stage, no negative, triple negative breast cancer? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um, if the patients had surgery already, which very often they have for you know, small triple negatives because you can't accurately estimate the size always uh, using radiolog radiologic means. Um, I kind of look at the size of the cancer and then kind of decide how to treat patients. So for sure, if the cancer is between one to two centimeters, I would recommend chemotherapy to that patient. And most likely, as you can see here, docetaxel cytoxin, um, then radiation if appropriate, um, and then surveillance after that. Uh, for T1A and T1B, um, again, I look at the size, the age of the patient, any comorbidities. But very often, if they're larger um, T1Bs, I, I might consider four cycles of docetaxel cytoxin for those patients as well. But it's really a shared decision with, with your patient and then standard local therapy after that. I don't typically treat uh, T1A, triple negative breast cancers, although I, I do think there in some cases uh, that might be warranted as well. Ruth, can I just add, though, um, one of the things I hope to do today is to reinforce the use of neoadjuvant therapy in some of those even small triple negatives. You know, it might be one and a half centimeters and a surgeon might say, oh, this is an easy lumpectomy. I can just do this. But you let the you lose the ability to assess that response like we'll talk about, I'm sure, in a second. So um I really hope to kind of pound that home today. <laughs> yeah, and, and I see, totally agree with that, Anna. And that's why I said if they've had surgery already when I see them, because I, I do agree with you. I think, you know, the larger T1Cs, we definitely would think about preoperative treatment, particularly in a younger patient. Um, you know, I think one of the things there is you kind of then have to think about adromycin cytoxin followed by paclitaxel in those patients because you don't know the exact stage, but absolutely agree with you. Absolutely, and we'll see that. The idea of neoadjuvant, of course, plays a bigger role with locally advanced or lymph node positive disease. Anna, you brought up of the role here of neoadjuvant, but let's say surgery upfront. In a clinically node negative patient, in your practice, when it comes to node evaluation for this disease subset, what does that look like? Yeah, so, you know, I fit these patients into Z11 criteria. Um, so I would do the sentinel node biopsy and, and, you know, continue them along, even with one or two positive nodes, they would not need an axillary dissection. So pretty standard at this point. I think most people accept that for all subtypes. Thanks. Now, going back to Ruth, from chemotherapy standpoint, now, when do you usually utilize TC versus ACT when talking about less than two centimeter? And what is a clinical scenario if one gets chemotherapy less than one centimeter, do you utilize chemotherapy in that patient population? Um, so, so I think I'm just to reword your 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 question. So, dealing with the the T1Bs first, I think, you know, first of all, I I wouldn't give them more than docetaxel cytoxin, um, and and I think again, you know, it depends on the size of the cancer you know, the age of the patient, any comorbidities, they're the kind of things I would take into account. Um, also keep in mind that, you know, triple negative is very heterogeneous and there is that low grade type that you sometimes see, um, which very often is apocrine features. And I th I'm, much, um, um, I'm much less likely to recommend chemotherapy to those patients than I would with somebody with more classical, classical triple negative breast cancers. Um, and I think the second part was for T1Cs, 
how do you decide between ACT versus TC? Um, the data from the ABC trials suggests that in those patients with node negative, smaller triple negatives, that they're fairly equivalent. Although there were nuances with that trial because those trials, because they do, did use more than four cycles of TC. Um, so I, I generally, unless it's a very young patient, I probably would just go with TC uh, up to two centimeters. But I think there are selective patients where I might use an anthracycline. You know, we have, as I'm sure you may would do as well, we have a cold cap machine. So we know that the cold caps work well with TC, but they don't really work very well once you start adding an anthracycline. And that's something to take into account as well, I think. Absolutely. And even just at San Antonio Breast Cancer 2023, we saw some debate about when to use anthracycline. Ruth, thank you for covering the early part. But moving on to high risk or locally advanced. And since July 2021, based off Keynote 522, immunotherapy has been part of the standard of care here. Can you please walk us through your treatment algorithm in this patient population? Yes, so um, for patients whose cancers are greater than or equal to two centimeters in size and are node positive, um, your options really are AC, um, AC followed by Pactitaxel, or more and more increasing, as you mentioned, the keynote regimen, which is, you know, AC, um, um, carboplatin, pactotaxel with the addition of pembrolizumab. Um, in terms of deciding about that, again, you know, I think taking in, obviously, patients with no positive disease, I would absolutely consider pembrolizumab. Larger cancers, I would certainly consider pembrolizumab. Obviously, it's a tougher treatment, and you can put patients at risk of longer-term um, immune-related toxicities. So, you know, taking into account, again, the patient's age, comorbidities, I, th I think would be important here. But we do know that the pathologic complete response rate is higher if you add in the immune therapy and the long-term outcome is also improved. Um, so that's kind of what I would do. Then they go to surgery. You make your decision based on what kind of response they had to that treatment. So it could be surveillance. Um, if they've had pembrolizumab right now, the standard of care is continue for a, 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 a total of approximately a year. If they have residual disease, keep cytobine for eight cycles based on CreateX. And then um, if they've got a BRCA1 or 2 germline mutation uh, using a PARP inhibitor, clearly we have data support doing that as well. Thanks, Ruth. Though we did see an update on San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium 2023 that EFS benefit has been sustained, in, particularly in T2N0 subset and node positive disease. So it's very important to stress that and utilize immunotherapy as much as we can in neoadjuvant setting. And coming to your point on multidisciplinary approach, it is very critical uh, to decide whether upfront surgery is beneficial versus neoadjuvant treatment, particularly uh, here in this disease, especially now with the EFS benefit. Any particular thoughts from what you were iterating before to community oncology here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that the real, like I said, from my standpoint, the real takeaway is that these patients should all have neoadjuvant therapy, um, you know, greater than two centimeters. I think it's almost malpractice at this point to not be doing neoadjuvant therapy. I mean, that's a bold statement, but, um, you know, but I, I really do believe in it. And I think, um, you know, we get the chance to isolate the therapies like Ruth talked about. Um, and I think from a surgery standpoint, we should not be worried about the axilla much anymore. Um, you know, we're seeing these higher PCR rates. So, I, you know, we're going to clear the axillary nodal disease most likely. Um, you know, and in terms of axillary management, I think the most important takeaway is that if there's residual disease, it really should be still doing an axillary dissection. Um, but I will say if you're supported by a multidisciplinary, you know, case conference, you can, I would say, we're getting to a point, discuss, you know, the volume of that residual disease. And if someone was CN0 and has a really small volume or CN1, really small volume, you know, some are considering omission of axillary dissection um, per St. Gallen, especially, um, you know, those experts have kind of said, we may not need, need to do these axillary dissections, even though we don't have data for this yet. Um, but I would say if you do not have the support of a multidisciplinary group, then, then you know, you should do a dissection for residual nodal disease. I was just going to say one other thing here, you know, I, and I don't know if this, there's really no J support doing this, but, you know, you know, key, the keynote regimen can be fairly you know, toxic, as we know, and most of us start with paclitaxel, carbo, and pembrolizumab. I will image them after the 12 weeks of treatment, and if they've had a complete response, 
in certain patients, I might talk to Anna and say, maybe we could do surgery and then decide whether they really need the anthracite on the back end. But there's nothing to support doing that. But I think that because PET-CR is such an important prognostic factor, I think it's a way of potentially de-escalating treatment as well. No, but the conversation is so important because if I'm still worried about their axilla or something like that, you know, then we will we won't do that. We'll just continue um, because we want to make sure we're utilizing the neoadjuvant therapy, you know, leveraging it to to you know minimize surgery too. Kind of a balance there. Yeah, absolutely. I, I and and I would never do it without talking to my surgical colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, in our field, we've historically overtreated. So now is the time to start doing this to de-escalate treatment. While we're talking about residual disease, Ruth, let me push you a little more on this idea. Patient got keno 522 up front. There is residual disease. Are you going to continue Pembro and add Cape Cytobine? If they have germline mutation, are you going to add Parpinibitter? I will usually continue the Pembrolizumab because we, we don't have data to stop it at, the, at this point. Um, there's plenty of safety data with Cape Cytobine and Pembrolizumab and with the PARP inhibitors and Pembrolizumab. So I'm pretty co comfortable doing that. Um, I think if they have a germline mutation, though, I would pick a PARP inhibitor over Cape Cytobine in that, in that setting because I think the data is a little bit more convincing. Absolutely. And just to go back on your point, Ruth, when a person who did have this limited therapy without anthracycline based, and the patient did have complete response, at least on radiological imaging, say PET-CT, after surgery, there is residual disease was found. In that case, are you planning to just continue on with pembrolizumab and add capecitabine because there was residual disease present at that time? I think it's a discussion, but, but I think that um, if they haven't had an anthracycline, you know, I, I think depending on the amount of residual disease, I would talk to them about doing the AC at that time point. Um, that's that's a, a real problem. That's why you have to, I think, be very careful in, in that scenario. Because, you, you know, I, I think as Rahul said, we we certainly don't want to over-treat, but we also don't want to under-treat. All right, mm -hmm. now switching gears to metastatic disease. Not long ago, we had very limited treatment options here. But now we have immunotherapy and antibody drug conjugates along with chemotherapy. Ruth, back at you. Can you share okay. your treatment algorithm for metastatic disease? Yeah, absolutely. And of course, you know, some of what we do is a little bit dependent on how, how when the patient relapsed after adjuvant treatment. But obviously, we'll check PDL1 status. Um, if it's positive, I would treat with pembrolizumab plus chemotherapy. The nice thing from the keynote study is that. You know, if they've had a prior taxane, you can use gem carbo as your chemotherapy backbone. If they're far out from a taxane, you know, we can use either pactotaxel or nap pactotaxel. If they're PDL1 negative, um, then I guess obviously looking at to see if they've got a BRCA mutation would make sense. The data from um, the um, with um, um, <laughs> with the PARP inhibitors do suggest that if if you give them the first line setting, they actually have more of an impact on survival. So I think doing that um, with a lap rib in particular, I think would be very reasonable here. If they don't, it's kind of a chemo of our choice. I think all the chemotherapy um, single agents are pretty much very similar in terms of response in, in that first line setting. And then a progression, I think, as you've outlined here, looking at HER2 status to see if they've got some low HER2 expression, in which case using transtuzumab deruxetecan would certainly be an option. And then sagituzumab, and there's very strong data with sagituzumab as well, in, and that's effective in both the HER2 low and the HER2 zero setting. So it's very exciting because we now have these ADCs that we didn't have before. And the question will be, of course, um, can we use them earlier? There's ongoing trials with um, sagituzumab in the first line setting, both with pembrolizumab and without pembrolizumab pembrolizumab, so we'll await the results from those. Exactly. It, uh, these are exciting times indeed, but it is important to keep the indication of utilization of these medications in mind that pembrolizumab in locally advanced setting is approved for all comers. When Ruth was stressing pdl one positive, that is pertinent to CPS score of more than or equal to 10, and that's when we can utilize in metastatic settings. Anna, any role of surgery or local regional for mainly for local regional control in metastatic setting, especially when we are talking about oligometastatic disease, because that question comes a lot, especially in community settings. Yeah, I would say rarely, but yes. Um, you know, so our clinical trials around this have shown no survival benefit. 
And then, of course, as surgeons, we hope that our surgeries would make people feel better, but they actually also showed no quality of life improvement either, uh, if anything, a little bit worse. Uh, so I really reserve surgery for the patients that have symptoms. Maybe they're having breast pain. Uh, maybe they have some breast lymphedema left, you know, remaining, even though they've had a good response. Um, is it close to the skin? And Are we worried later when they stop responding, there's going to be a wound because it's really superficial? You know, those are the, really the patients that I reserve surgery for in this setting. It's very tempting in oligometastatic disease to, to do a surgery, but it's um, there's just not a really big indication for it. And I thank you for covering that, especially in metastatic settings. It's so important to keep these two things in mind. Is it going to affect your overall survival? Is it helping your symptoms or quality of life? As we're nearing the end, I want to take a few minutes to talk about supportive care and toxicity management, especially when we're talking about antibody drug conjugates. Ruth, with TDXD, we worry about fatigue, nausea, hair loss, and pneumonitis, whereas when it comes to sasetizumab, we worry about neutropenia and diarrhea. Any clinical pearls to manage these toxicities with these new ADCs? I, I think just being very proactive on them. I mean, they are, they do have some toxicity. There's no question about it. And I think it's always a very unfortunate when you cause alopecia to patients with metastatic disease. But given how effective they are, you know, I think most patients are, are probably okay with that. Um, you know, I think diarrhea, we have lots of anti-diarrheals. Being very proactive with that, I think, makes sense. You know, being very careful with the TDXD to to basically look for any pneumonitis because obviously that's a very serious side effect for patients. Yeah. So as community oncologists, we get to use sasetizumab in bladder cancer. You brought up a trial mm -hmm. for SASI and Pembro that's happening in lung cancer as well. And TDXD mm -hmm. is now approved almost in every disease site. And the idea of pneumonitis is important because there were deaths related to this. So we have to keep that in mind and stopping and using steroids in that case is very important. And sasetizumab, we know we have overall survival benefit here, but managing that neutropenia and diarrhea is critical. So Ruth, thank you for going over that. Right, we're used to seeing pneumonitis, especially with immunotherapy, but again, the TDXD uh, pneumonitis is extremely concerning as Rahul mentioned, mortality association with it, which is certainly very concerning. So one has to be very, very diligent with uh, acting on it. Well, we've covered a lot here. Ruth and Anna, thank you so much for joining us and reiterating the current standard of care for triple negative breast cancer today. For our listeners, stay tuned for a short recap. In this discussion with Drs. Ruth O'Regan and Anna Weiss from Wellmore Cancer Center, we covered the current standard of care for triple negative breast cancer. The importance of a multidisciplinary approach in this disease cannot be stressed enough. When looking at early and locally advanced disease, we have discussed the role of immunotherapy in neoadjuvant and adjuvant settings. When focusing on metastatic disease, immunotherapy plays a role here as well, but with CPS of 10 and above. Then we've also discussed role of TDXD and sasetizumab and chemotherapy in this space. The jury is yet to be out on what exactly is the correct sequence for these antibody drug conjugates, but we fortunately have these treatment options available for our patients today. Make sure to check out our HER2 positive and hormone receptor positive discussions as well. We are the Oncology Brothers.